hope everybody uh, enjoyed those presentations. They were, they were fascinating, a lot of food for thought. It has stimulated quite a few questions, which I'm now going to uh, put, put to everybody. Kate, you're still with us. Um, Kate, um, there was, you mentioned um, during your presentation the Target example and uh, click and collect and how that drove down, considerably drove down costs um, for companies. Um, in a city like Belfast, quite a lot of independent retailers, small businesses. Is there any way in which businesses like that could perhaps collaborate uh, and work together um, to maximise those click and collect opportunities if they don't have perhaps the capacity to do that themselves? Yeah, I think the easiest thing to do would be to offer a joined up delivery service or maybe, I don't know, I think one of the easiest ways to offer delivery from store is to work with one of the third parties that you can just bring into your business on a plug and play basis. So I would recommend that, but there's no reason why they can't pick up things from multiple stores at the same time. So that seems like a very simple, quick win, in fact, just to get the same person to do multiple pickups. So I'm not sure of a company that specifically offers that, but we can look into that because I think that's a fantastic idea. As soon as you lower the cost of delivery, it really opens up that opportunity. Thanks, Kate. Ed, you ended your presentation with a quote from Jeff Bezos. Yep. Um, not sure he's everybody's favourite of that month, but he, <laughs> he provides a service, put it Doesn't like that. Be, yeah. uh, and he talked about you know what doesn't change over the next 10 years. Um, and you're thinking, what do you think is not going to change over the next period? What's not going to change in the next 10 years? Um, I think, I mean, I, 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 again, I, I would sort of default to, 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 to the same answer, which is, which is um, customers' wants and needs. Um, it's really, really fashionable to talk about change um, and things that will change, new tech, and, and, and the way I see it is that these are enablers to get us to uh, communicate to new audiences, uh, reach them at a lower cost, or, or, or hit them with new creative, new ways, uh, new messages, that type of thing. But, but at the core behind all of those platforms and all of those changes are still the same customers uh, with the same wants and needs. They want cheaper costs, quicker delivery, more options, more range, uh, those types of things. And, and, and I, I think really, it's we're in such uncertain times it's difficult to think about what is you know what is going to remain constant beyond that but if you look back that's always been a constant so yeah i mean i i, I think that's really where where businesses need to look focus their attention and, and and look at their own customers you know um rather than you know a competitor's customers or another sector's customers their customers that they know and and and, and trust thanks ed paul uh sorry i should have thanked Bruno lawler from Belfast City Council for that question. Paul James is uh, in another room so that we're all the proper distance up, apart here. Um, Paul, we've got a question from Fiona Rooney, which I think is probably best for you. How important will e-commerce be if indeed we get a, a second wave of the coronavirus? Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, so along with the general importance of e-commerce going forward, um, in terms of the in terms of the scale of it, adoption, um, e-commerce and the online experience offers a level of protection for for most businesses. <clears throat> so, for example, you could have a second wave. You could have a fire, a pre-mark fire, not so long ago. You could have any other event that could potentially close down your store, and that online experience or e-commerce offers that level of protection. So, what I often say to people uh, and say to clients is that. Look, like if you could if you could switch the clock back to you know March, the beginning of March, and if you were to know this was coming down the track, what would you have done to prepare? What, what would you have done differently to in order to protect yourself over the, over the next few months? And whatever the answer to that question is, think about doing that now, because there's no doubt that that second wave could come, and even if it doesn't, any other event could could happen. Uh, so think about what that preparation is now and, and get it done. And certainly e-commerce or online experiences um, is, is, a, is a very sound way to go. I'm sure Kate would attest to that in terms of the, the sort of omni-channel and, and the flexible, e, uh, flexible retail ecosystem that, that she was talking about. Kate, is there anything you want to say on that question about 
what people should do to prepare, not just for the potential of a second wave, but just anything that could, could, could happen? Sure, yeah. So um, I think I mentioned this. I didn't have time to go into it fully, but something that we really recommend people do is scenario plan. So this is perfect when you don't know what might happen next. You can maybe say, well, what happens if there is another lockdown? What, how can we make the best of that situation? What happens if things open up again? Or you can map out any one of a number of catastrophic scenarios if you want to work out how your business could make the best of that. You can then set, with your team, you can set signals or triggers, so things to look out for. And so that can act almost as a shorthand. So if you see certain things happening, then your team know to act and um, yeah, take action on one of one or two of your particular scenarios and the things you've already planned. So it just means you're not caught on the back foot, that when things happen, you're not spending time working out what to do. When you see something happen, you can actually leap into action. You don't miss a beat and you can keep moving forward and making the best of things. So that is, yeah, scenario planning in a nutshell. It's uh, There's quite a lot more to it than that, but that's the two-minute description, I guess. Thanks, Kate. Ali, um, Nigel Brannigan from Factor has asked, what's the, in your view, what's, what's the best channel for driving e-commerce visits? Is it digital itself? Because obviously people are already online. Yeah, uh, I think that's the assumption that most people would make. Uh, digital is very attributable. You're already online, so it's a rational thought that you'll be online, see an ad and purchase. But we are not that rational as human beings. Um, so my answer to that is probably not as, as clean as, as Nigel would like to hear. But if you have a limited budget, spread it across a couple of media channels. That's going to be much, much more effective than plowing all your money into digital. Reason being, if you think about some of the, the biggest online companies in the world, uh, Amazon, it's one of the biggest spenders on TV advertising. They understand the importance of advertising on digital, but they also understand that that plays a part of their ecosystem for marketing. They need to be on other channels. Same for Netflix, one of the biggest advertisers on outdoor. So my answer would be, yes, digital is important, but definitely spread your, um, your media budget across a couple of channels. And you mentioned budget and yep. Tara Craig from National Trust has asked about with businesses and brands starting to maybe reactivate a bit more and do yep. a little bit more. Is there a risk that media costs will start to rise as a result? It's a really good thing to be aware of. Maybe it ties back what into Kate was saying about scenario planning. Um, and with the way that we're working with media at the minute is it's supply and demand. So supply is there, the demand is down because marketing budgets are obviously down. So it is a little bit cheaper at the minute. I don't see it going to be more expensive than it was pre-COVID. I do see it going up a little bit in the coming months, but that's something that we can keep an eye on in the agency and then scenario plan with your budget. So you can be quite agile rather than maybe being locked in for two years with something that is going to be out of date by the time we get there. Okay, thank you. I think we've time for one last question. One for you, Paul, from, from Marty Fearon. You showed the Maltesers advert, which used the sort of virtual communication channels that we're all now very familiar with. Uh, I'm, I'm, and Marty has asked, are adverts like that now affordable for smaller businesses? I'm an ideas man. I don't really care about budget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to be honest, to be honest, um, you know that ad is not um, is not a Zoom meeting. They, you know, they've created that. That's actors and Maltesers have deep pockets. But the truth of the matter is, we're changing the way that the production is happening. I mean, I, I mentioned a Lidl ad there earlier. Um, we film that on iPhones and gimbals, you know, and it's broadcast quality. So it's really good. But I suppose the point I would rather make is that. Um, you know, not even not even just in creativity, but in any in, in any sector, um, a good idea shouldn't be strangleholded by logistics. And in fact, you know, if you are trying to if you are trying to come up with an idea based on this, the already the production platforms that you've got, it's probably not the right idea. You need to find a new way of releasing it. And and that's what I think everything has been about here today is that it's not the conventional channels that we're all, that we're all expecting. And that was why I'd kind of showed a broad range of um, creative and tonal solutions to show that it's not just an advertisement that it requires, it requires uh, a solution of, of, of any sort. But, you know, to, to, to answer that question, production values, um, 
you know, are accepted um, that they're lower now. And, you know, something like that one, you get an authenticity from it because those people, you see them in real life and you believe them, you know. So, yes, we can do it, but it, it, we shouldn't let it worry us either. You know, I hope Thanks. that's it. Thanks, Paul. That brings us to the end of today's event. Um, it just leaves it to me to say thank you to Ardmore for uh, organising today's event. It's been, from a Belfast Chamber perspective, it's been a real privilege to, to be able to work with them in the run-up to this event and to deliver it uh, today. Particularly, can I thank Kate for her time and for her excellent presentation earlier. And can I also thank guys here at Nyavac for um, putting up, letting, letting us come here, do this, and the quality of the production that they have helped us to make today. Um, so the last person, the last people I want to thank are everybody who has tuned in. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We hope you found that useful. Um, there was lots of engagement online. Any questions that we didn't get to in the session, we'll try to answer in the days to come. So thank you everybody for uh, joining with us today. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if there's anything anybody wants to follow up, please do so by contacting us at Belfast Chamber or Ardmore. Thank you very much.